it seems to be what you're saying is that in some way, whatever you practice, that's sort of the essence of the law, the law that this is where you're taking someone's life, or possibly, and that um, if that part doesn't work, that, that it's like the ultimate sort of responsibility. And so that as a lawyer, as part of the system, you should be held, or at least you should be aware of it, so that you're, that that's, I mean, that goes back to the whole creation of the U.S. and all that kind of stuff, that it's the, the core thing. That it's, is that, I mean, am I getting it? I mean, is yeah, that what you're well, saying? Yeah, let me give you another example. People who want to be judges, you were asking about that earlier. I'm sure you know every candidate who goes to be interviewed uh, by, uh, by any of the judicial selection commissions or by the governor is asked, could you administer the death penalty? Could you hand down a death sentence? And every judge in this state has answered that question, yes. Now, how many of them knew what they were saying when they answered that question? How many of them knew enough about the capital punishment system to really be able to say that they could do that? Uh, I would submit to you that most of them knew absolutely nothing. And I, indeed, some of them didn't even know that they were going to be the ones who were going to do the sentencing. They just figured, well, the jury will do the sentencing, and you know, that'll just, I'll just sort of carry out the, whatever the jury says. Um, so, I mean, I, I mean, isn't that horrific? I mean, it, it just to me, it just it, w it would to for somebody to get to the point of being considered as a judge and not to have really grappled with this question. Uh, pretty unbelievable, I think. Well, it makes a lot of sense. I mean. There's a lot of, obviously, it's a hu hugely hotly debated topic, and um, it's, it just makes a lot of sense. It's, it's not about the politics of it, it's about how our justice system works and sort of what that means. And in that sense, it is political, but it isn't, it's a very interesting way but to it's get also, around it. It's also, it, it's also a, a matter of responsibility. Um, it, it's not acceptable to say that you as a lawyer in Arizona are not responsible for the criminal justice system that we have, and particularly the criminal justice system we have that affects life and death. Mm -hmm. um, someone who is hired as a correctional officer um, may be able to sleep at night and say, look, when I'm assigned to the task of being on the on the execution crew, I'm just doing my job. I don't take any pleasure in it. I have no opinion about it. I'm just doing my job. Uh, and I have heard that more times than than I than I care to remember. Uh, but I don't think a lawyer can say that. I don't think I don't think a prosecutor ought to be able to say that. I don't think a judge ought to be able to say that. I think. The prosecutors who tell me that they have no opinion on the death penalty, that they're just doing their job, or the ones who don't do capital work, who say, I'm in the county attorney's office, but I only do uh, hate crimes, and I don't do capital work, so don't bother me. I don't know anything about it, and I don't want to know anything about it. I think it's unacceptable. It's part of their responsibility. And I think if, if every lawyer felt that way, if every lawyer felt that it was her or his responsibility to get close to the death penalty and know something about it, my guess is we either wouldn't have a death penalty or we would have something very, very different th than the one we have. And by the way, um, last fall I took a sabbatical. Mm -hmm. I've taken three. I get almost as many as the really good law professors. Uh, but my wife and I went to, to Europe, and one of the things I did was talk about the death penalty uh, to to a variety of people at various places, mostly young lawyers. Um, and it's a pretty amazing experience because young lawyers in other countries can't understand what we're doing. It is, it is, a, it is a, 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 a matter of, of great amazement to them that we have a death penalty. How is it the greatest country on earth, the most civilized country, has the death penalty? And what do you tell them? Well, let me tell you what the president of the American Bar Association uh, has told him. I think this is a wonderful story. Martha Bennett is her name. Uh, she is, where's it, Barnett? Uh, anyway, she's, 
She's, she's from Tallahassee, Florida, and has been the bar president this year. She tells a wonderful story. She was a lawyer in Florida. Her husband's a lawyer. She'd been a corporate lawyer throughout her career. She'd been practicing for about 30 years. She became the president of the American Bar Association. Never had done criminal work and never had done anything in the capital punishment arena. Shortly after she became the president of the bar, she went to France on May 1, the opening of the French legal year. And she describes it as a splendid occasion, uh, and it must be. They all come in in their robes, and there are hundreds of people there, and they have this huge hall with the chandeliers. And she was given a seat right on the front row because she was the president of the American Bar Association. And the president of the French bar stood up and began speaking. And he was speaking in French. She didn't speak any French, which was fine with her because she wanted to take in all the ambiance and she was sitting back enjoying the wondrous occasion. And all of a sudden she began to realize that he wasn't speaking in French anymore. He had started speaking in English. And then she began to realize that he was speaking to her. And she sort of brought herself back and started paying attention and he was asking her why do you have the death penalty? Why do you execute children? Why do you execute the mentally retarded? And she had to say, I don't know. It was the defining moment in her life as a lawyer. It has changed her dramatically. Now she is leading the moratorium uh, against the death penalty. She's not sure yet that she's prepared to say that we shouldn't have a death penalty, but she is sure that we ought to have a moratorium. And she's horrified that she could have lived in Florida, a state that has had the death penalty uh, for as long as she's been a lawyer, and couldn't answer basic questions about the, couldn't defend it intelligently, uh, had always thought it was quite all right to have it. But when it got down to the details, she couldn't, she couldn't do it. And, it. and it made a tremendous difference in her assessment of herself as a lawyer. She was humiliated. Uh, and I say she should have been. Uh, but I admire her endlessly for having the courage to recognize it and say, I ought to learn something about this. So what? So... So you're not done yet. Uh, what, do you do? <laughs> what do you do with um? So, so advice. How do you learn about it? What do you do? What do you? How do you get involved? What do you? I mean, you've got a captive audience. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, well, there are there are lots of ways. Um, the the first thing I say to people is is make it your again. I, I'm sounding a little bit pontificate pontifical, <laughs> but that there's no excuse for any lawyer not reading newspapers. Whether you like the newspaper or not, um, I, I cannot understand why a lawyer wouldn't read the newspaper every day. Uh, you're, in a, you're in a world in which you are in public law and public life every day, no matter what kind of lawyer you are. If you read the newspaper, uh, make it your business to read the criminal law related stories whether you're a criminal lawyer or not. Uh, and that will then force you to read the articles that have to do with capital punishment. Um, follow those cases, uh, whether it matters to your practice or not. Um, and, and what I see happen when people start doing that, then they start saying, well, you know, maybe I should go watch a trial. Maybe I should, should take an afternoon off. Or maybe I should, should call up the defense lawyer and say, I'd like to have lunch with you, or call up the prosecutor and say, when the trial is over, I'd like to come talk to you. I'd like to understand how you saw this case. I don't know a lawyer who would be offended by a, by a young lawyer calling and saying, I, just, I would just like to know more about why you did what you did or how you approached the case or whether you were afraid of your client or, you know, a thousand other questions. Um, the State Bar has seminars um, every year uh, on, on, on capital law uh, related matters. You don't have to be an expert in, in 
capital defense to attend a conference. Um, why not go and learn something about something that, that you don't do? So there are lots of ways to learn. All right, can I ask you two more questions? Sure. We've gone over than we normally do, but um, okay, here's two questions. First, yeah, we're, we're trying to get a spiritual question in, but I want to do it in a little bit of a different negative way. We'll see how this works. You see a lot of bad, again, sadness, badness, all these things. Sort of how do you think about like the world and humanity and like why we're here and, and sort of you see all these people who, for whatever reason, bad parents or bad chemistry or, or I don't know, just bad luck end up where they are and, and and the system, and sometimes it's good, and sometimes it's bad, and sort of how do you think about all of that and deal with all of that and sort of a, when you step back kind of way, I don't know if it's a reasonable thing to ask, but. Let me tell you about what happened to me this morning. I was asked to, a, to attend a meeting uh, organized by, by the Catholic uh, Services Organization in Phoenix. I am not a Catholic. No Catholic Church would have me. Um, but I, 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 w I got this, this call a few weeks ago saying we're having a, a meeting and we've invited a bunch of different people. Would you mind coming and spending a morning with us? I had no idea of what was going to happen. I went into a room and there were about 25 people there, two lawyers uh, and, uh, and maybe 20 to 23 uh, other people who turned out to be people who deal with the homeless people who deal with the prison ministries, people who, who some of them were former inmates, uh, two of them were a man and a woman. Um, there, were, there were people there who were social workers, uh, and they were there to talk about what the Catholic Church ought to do about justice in Arizona. Kind of an interesting thing. Uh, the, 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 that the bishop of Arizona is going to do a pastoral letter on on the criminal justice system in the state, and they wanted to have people from a variety of perspectives. Uh, and I sat there for three hours and listened to people talk about their experiences in the in the world of criminal justice from the standpoint of victims, from the standpoint of a police officer who does hate crimes. Uh, from the perspective of people who had been in, in prison. Uh, I found it enormously uplifting. Uh, it reminded me that, that there are a lot of people out there who really do care about making things better. And a lot of them aren't lawyers, uh, who really do want to make a difference, who, who want to be able to say, I have helped uh, improve the lives of people in this system. I've, I've, I've attacked the root causes. Um, there's a tremendous wealth out there of people who really do want to help. And so when I get discouraged about, about all the bad stuff that, that, that goes on, I'm going to try to remember this morning and remember that there are people. And by the way, they didn't say I was just a dirty shirt criminal defense lawyer. It was awfully nice. People said things like, hello. <laughs> you know? They said, thank you. Uh, so I mean, I'm, I'm sort of joking about it, but it was, it's very, very important, I think, for us to remember that, that what we do as lawyers um, really, really can help other people. And there are a lot of other people out there who want to help. That's really, that's very good. All right, last, last question. I bet you never thought I would finally say <laughs> oh, that. I'm, I'm um, enjoying this immensely. This I'm great. sure you can tell. No, this is great. Um, Happiest moment, happy moments in law? Um, I'm not sure I can tell this story. I'll try. Okay. Okay. Hmm. Um, <laughs> I'm pretty sure I can't do this. Uh, for about uh, 13 years, we represented the man I mentioned earlier who was charged with torching his children. Mm -hmm. um, he was eventually uh, freed and is a, is a free man today uh, living in Pennsylvania. Um, at that moment in my life, I thought, this is about as good as it's going to get. This is as happy as you can be. But I was wrong. 
uh, within three days of his re re release, um, my law firm, um, by the way, had had devoted several hundred thousand dollars of the law firm's money and about three million dollars in lawyer time to the case over more than a decade in a case that they didn't intend to get into and nobody could quite remember how we'd ever gotten into it but we knew we were never going to do this again we had done our bit for public service and I got a letter from the state prison from a man named Ray Girdler and the letter began I too am an innocent man um, I've read about your case my case is very much like the case of the man who has just been released. Would you help me? Now, what do you think we did? Did you help him? <laughs> no. No. We walked around the law firm. Colin Campbell was then my partner. He's now the presiding judge in Maricopa County. He was the person I had done the case with or finished it with. We walked around our law office with that letter in our hand and we showed it to lawyer after lawyer after lawyer, and we laughed. And we said, how many of these do you think we're going to get from people who would like to have a lawyer handle right. their case pro bono? But we assured them that we would not take this case. Uh, and we didn't. We sent him back a letter, and we said to him, effectively, we had done our bit for public service, and we had no more pro bono resources to devote to his case. And we didn't feel too bad about doing that. He sent us back a letter, and the second letter said, I understand fully what you said, and I appreciate it. Uh, I, I probably shouldn't have asked you in the first place, um, but could you d do this for me? I know there were a lot of transcripts from your trial, and you had a whole bunch of experts on fire science. I think those fire science opinions could be of use to me. Uh, would you mind sending me a copy of the transcript? 2,000 pages. We thought Xeroxing is a profit center for our law firm. We probably make more money off Xeroxing than we do off our lawyers, so why not? I mean, really, it'll keep him busy, it'll keep him out of trouble. Uh, so we sent him the transcripts. And now we were finished. No. Six months later, we got a call. This is the part of the story I start having trouble with, so I'll, I'll, you have to bear with me. But we got a call from Prescott, Arizona, from a judge um, who had been the judge who had sentenced this man. Um, he had sentenced the man not to death, but to two consecutive life terms for killing his wife and baby daughter by pouring a gallon of gasoline around their bed and striking the match and killing them, incinerating them. Um, that judge had, at sentencing, had said, I'm not going to sentence you to death because it's not a bad enough sentence. I want you to live every day as a living hell. Uh, I want you not to be eligible for parole until your hundredth birthday if you live that long. You're the most vile, heinous criminal who's ever come into my court. That judge called us and said, I've received a petition from this man, and I'm very troubled about what has happened to him. Would you come up to Prescott and look at this file? Now what do you think we said? <laughs> uh, actually, some of our partners again said, you cannot, you cannot get in your truck and go up there. Um, but uh, Colin and I did. Uh, with all appropriate promises to our partners that we would not get sucked into this thing. We thought if a judge calls us and asks us to come, he actually asked us to come and talk to the court-appointed lawyer, who had, a lawyer had been appointed to represent him in his post-conviction relief petition, and he asked us to just come and spend a day with that lawyer. We went to Prescott, uh, and what I, I, I know when I, when I die I will think that this is the day that I will remember it best. We went up there and we started looking at that file, and it was unbelievable. That case was, was worse than the case we had just finished. This man was the most totally innocent defendant I had, and I'd been practicing at that time for 20 years, that I had ever seen. Um, 
the, the witnesses who testified against him were the same fire experts who had testified in our case. We knew these witnesses. We knew that they were charlatans. Um, and yet they had, they had after, after our case had been in trial back in the early 70s, now they had testified in another case and had done the same thing. And a totally innocent man who didn't confess to the crime uh, had had also been convicted and been given a sentence. Well, I mean, oh, it was just, it was really overwhelming to me. We took the case. I'm not quite sure how. I, uh, there are people in my law firm who still think that we did this under cover of darkness, but <laughs> we, we took the case, and that man um, is now is now a free man. Uh, he he uh, works as a bank teller in Phoenix. He has been, he spent uh, nine years in prison. The first eight in, in isolation, because if you're a baby killer, that's a, that's a bad thing to be. Um, and for me, the, 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 the best that it ever could have been as a lawyer was having a, a, an environment in which there were, there were enough other people who would say, if there ever is a second innocent man, <laughs> we'll take his case. Uh, it meant more to me and more to the people that I practice with, to the secretaries, to the messengers, to the and just everybody in our organization has had that experience. They have all seen someone who they thought was the vilest, most evil killer uh, freed and then find out that he's not the only person on earth uh, who might have been wrongfully convicted. Uh, so that's my happiest moment. That was a pretty happy moment. Um, Sorry. Did it take a long time to get the second one through? Yeah, <laughs> it did. It took a lot of money, too. <laughs> the, the hearing that ultimately resulted in his release uh, went all summer in, in Prescott, Arizona in 1991. Um, it's sort of funny, by the way. The guy who had sucked me into this was the, my partner. He, he left to become a judge. Um, and I say he's now the presiding uh, judge, but he was not there for the hearing. Um, and before he left, he went to the the oldest lawyer in our firm at that time, uh, who was a U of A graduate. His name is Ed Hendricks. And he said, Ed, you ought to do this hearing with Larry. And he said, well, I don't do criminal work. And Colin said, well, you ought to do this with Larry. And he finally decided that he should, and he spent the summer doing that hearing with me. And we did a a criminal hearing the way the very best civil lawyers in the state would do a civil case. We had we had hot and cold running paralegals. We had three ring binders, you know, notebooks that you could stack on a on the shelf. We had the best cross examination I have ever seen, ever, of a, a of a of a police official, done by a guy who has never examined a police officer in his life. Uh, so it did take a lot of time, and it cost us a lot of money. Uh, but that, but, but Ed Hendricks would tell you, and you ought to have Ed do one of these. He's a wonderful. Mm -hmm. Oh, you are doing mm -hmm. it. Will you ask him? He will. I think he will tell you that his best experience as a lawyer. If he doesn't, I'm going to beat him. Up. But it, I, I think <laughs> he will tell you. You can't cheat now. I, think, I won't call him. Okay. But his, his best experience as a lawyer was doing that case, a case that we had turned down. So. No, that's a pretty good. Yeah. All right. Anything else before we turn off? No. Thank you so much.